Hello and welcome to Reach Live. Thank you for being with us. If you're watching on demand, welcome. Um, I'm Rina Such. I'm the host of Reach Live. I'm the head of digital and connected health at Ipsos. Ipsos are a global market research and insight agency. And we do all things to do with data and insight. And Reach is, um, is, is, is a nonprofit organization that is working as a thought leader within digital health. And I encourage you all to click the link and go to reachtl.org and check out all the content that's available to you, including Reach Radio, uh, which you can make to become your favorite podcast if you're into podcasts. Um, and Reach Live each Friday, last Friday of every month, uh, has a guest and it's an absolute pleasure for me. I get to meet extraordinary individuals and have great conversations. And today is no less. The topic for today is health equity. So the role of technology in establishing and maintaining health equity. And it's not something we are taking in vain. It's a, it's a, it's a huge topic and it requires deep infrastructural change, but also mindset and culture change. And I'm delighted to have our guest here today who comes from a really interesting background, something quite, um, I find quite engaging and intriguing because it's a state state role that she's had for many years and how it's evolved into being about health equity is really, really interesting. So Mignon, welcome to Reach Live. Please come in and give an introduction to yourself and let everyone know your background and a bit more about you. It's uh, my, my pleasure uh, to join you. Uh, so you find before you a former regulator, both at the state level as well as the federal level. So I spent about 11 years at the state, South Carolina State Public Service Commission and about eight and a half years at the Federal Communications Commission. And what I found was, and what was reinforced at those two agencies, is how codependent we are when it comes to regulation, technology, and health equity. The promise of it or it not being available at all. And so uh, what where we find ourselves now is at a critical crossroads uh, where we need to keep in mind and um, really reaffirm to ourselves uh, that we are all in this together, that we can do well and do good and be good stewards um, at the same time. There are very few things that are mutually exclusive, and um, I think there's an exciting but challenging uh, series of days ahead of us. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. So talk to me a little bit more about state regulation. Uh, it's, it's intriguing to me um, in terms of what is it, what does it entail when you're at commissioning level? What types of decisions are you making and why are they important? Well, one of the things about state regulation, a lot of it um, was further defined uh, with the 1996 Telecommunications Act. I promise not to get too geeky, but what that did was open up the the floodgates in terms of competition, and it redefined what regulation was and where it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw things uh, become more open uh, for new entrants, for innovators, um, you know, mm -hmm. all across the nation and across the world. But what you also uh, saw was states getting out of the telecommunications technology business. They were taking more of a back seat. And so while we were still providing protections for what we call POTS, plain old telephone service, just picking up the, the phone, you hearing that dial tone and, and, and dialing from your wall, you know, that, that phone on the wall, um, to a whole new wireless uh, universe uh, that is bringing us uh, that mobility, uh, that uh, demand on the go, and all of these things that are more accessible if you are connected, if you can afford that connection, and if that infrastructure is there uh, where you are. So things shifted a bit on the federal side, shifted a lot from the deregulatory side. Uh, and where we find ourselves is the, the regulator closer to your home has less of an influence over what goes on in your most frequently used day-to-day -day interaction with the internet, with your uh, communications device. Uh, and um, honestly, on the federal end, more of a backseat, 
but uh, today uh, you see more and hear more conversations about should we revisit some of this? You know, what role other than uh, ensuring that monies are flowing? You've been hearing a lot of money going to the states. You've been hearing that from Congress through federal agencies like the FCC and the NTIA, the, the Telecommunications Information Agency that's a part of um, you know, the White House's um, uh, orbit. And, and so you're seeing some shifts and you're seeing some recognition that with all of this by way of disruption that we've seen since 1996, there are too many people that are being left behind mm -hmm. and we have to do something about it. There are too many in too many places uh, around this country, rural places, and uh, areas where there are low income or low net worth individual. And to be honest with you, with the pandemic and more, that number is going wider and that footprint is getting larger. Hmm. This is why regulation and policy is so important. And when we talk about health and tech, it comes up time and time again, because it is the driving force of making things happen. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, you started off in the tech infrastructure space, right? So you're trying to make sure that everyone can get access and you're making sure there's competition, fair competition in the marketplace. Then over time that changes, right? As more things go direct to consumer, as more individuals can get competitive pricing. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. How does that play out? Does that mean, because that's risky, right? Because a lot of tech today is direct to consumer. So those individuals that can afford it, that have acts, you know, that are able to have the health literacy, health literacy is huge, to understand what they need, are getting what they need. But the gap is therefore getting bigger, much like you just said around COVID, exacerbating the gap. So how does that play out at a state level when, when you're in your role? Would you see things start to move more to the consumer and therefore you, the state would kind of scale back? So I will say the promise of it is there, meaning more direct and personalized uh, options, uh, you know, for individuals. So the promise is there, uh, but I am not sure, and I will argue uh, on the grand scale that we need it, uh, that uh, the devices, uh, that um, the tools, that the options are not there where they're needed the most. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of times when innovators come in this space, they assume that we're all connected. But I just affirm to you on a rural um, and an urban basis where there are economic uh, challenges, that that is not the case. Uh, that um, we do have a challenge when it comes uh, to um, you know, affordability, when it comes to infrastructure in the ground. There are critical challenges uh, that remain that I don't know if the innovators um, that uh, you uh, interact with on a regular basis, that they see that that they take that into account, that they take into account the inequities that currently exist, the biases that currently exist, do they take that into account when they are on the drawing board coming up with that concept, uh, when they are designing, do they have those persons in mind? Uh, do they have um, the, the people, uh, again, that might not have the digital skills um, that, that are, are, uh, are innate or that are um, second nature for them. A lot of people need technologies and can benefit from being connected the most are not digital natives. So are we um, from inception to market really taking into account not only their needs, but what you're as an innovator and designer, um, where your next million dollars will be made? Uh, your first millions might, might be made from the digitally connected. You're leaving a lot of opportunities on the ground and our country is not benefiting robustly from a, a digitally connected health future if you don't think about the rest of us um, that um, are not currently um, a, a, a part of this uh, grand scheme uh, that cannot afford today. Because the government is putting its thumb on a scale a hundred million plus dollars is going to each state um, over the coming years through the states. Those legislators, um, those broadband officers are going to have a lot of power and influence. Are you as an innovator ready 
Um, had you thought about those who need these um, services? Have you challenged the government to come up with um, concepts and models that would incent you economically uh, to mm -hmm. uh, not only in, invent, um, but to uh, be make a part of your design, these individuals? Because if I am um, using your device and you're, you can't see me, and I've had that to happen in the earlier stages of, of AI and facial recognition, then there's a problem. I am invisible. Mm -hmm. And you are leaving uh, um, uh, on the table a lot of money and a lot of opportunities, and you are further disadvantaging me if you don't see me, if I was not a part of your protocols and, and design, if I'm not part of your studies. If I am invisible, you could be actually harming me more because mm -hmm. if the marketplace or my clinician decides to adopt these um, standards or your concept, and you absolutely did not have me in mind, then what type of care am I going to get going forward? So I'm saying all that to say that from a government point of view, from an entrepreneurial point of view, and from an all of the above point of view, we need to say and to ask ourselves, what role do we play in a digitally connected future? And are we looking at every opportunity, uh, every market, uh, and every characteristic needed um, so that all of us can be improved uh, uh, by uh, your invention. I absolutely love that. So well said, honestly, so well said. From intention all the way through to execution and, you know, am I invisible? Yeah, it's, so, it's just such a simple phrase and, and so many people feel that way. And there is a lot going on really with, with uh, intention, I'd say. I'll give you an example in the UK. So the NHS are moving forward, National Health Service here, to offer um, remote patient monitoring for diabetes. And they've recently, it's just been announced in the news that Big Health's product Sleepio, which is a sleep-based cognitive behavioral therapy app, is now going to be available and pushed through. And it's been recommended by NICE guidelines to be first in line therapy before drugs. Great really strong but actually on the ground the rollout has still got huge issues huge issues in terms of how accessible is it really um, from from individuals having to jump quite a few hoops to get what they need within within the rules of what's there so i think yeah announcements and all that are good but technology companies have to really think about where is their products being available how easy is the experience for every individual and you're right if you're not in the research studies you're not being seen if you're not in the sample, you're not being seen. Um, let's talk about health, a bit more focused. So I'm, I'm intrigued, intrigued in how your role kind of went from technology infrastructure into health. So give us a little bit about that, because I think that's really interesting. Well, you know, it. I thought it was going to be more organic from a, a government standpoint when I was at the FCC, but when we created what we call a Connect to Health Task Force, there were people still asking, what does the FCC have to do with health? And I was just floored uh, that we were getting uh, that question in the 2000s, <laughs> in, 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 the, you know, in the 2000s. Teens. Um, uh, but we kept pressing. And uh, what we firm, affirmed and what we saw, that broadband is at the epicenter. That's the seed. Uh, it, that, um, that, it, it, and it's responsible our responsibility to help the so that we proved it uh, mightily when it came to the schools and libraries program, we call it E-rate. Um, it's a tremendous success uh, in, in areas of the country uh, where the local communities could not, did not have that 60% Delta to, to afford uh, those uh, computers and connectivities in the, in the libraries in those schools. Why? Should be both, why should health be any different? Uh, if you look at those rural healthcare centers and provide opportunities there, provide economic incentives there, then what could would happen? Then you will have electronic, uh, you know, solutions when it comes to the, our, our our healthcare records. If those places are connected, and if we ensure that there's seamless connectivity from the time I walk into that clinic to the time I go home and get, hopefully, 
care reinforced from a device as we as we're communicating now uh, from a connected um, series of devices that can monitor um, you know my heart and oxygen levels and send those signals quickly to you then what's the possibility what, what are the gains um, you know realize and, and so you know what you know you quickly realize is uh, it is very interconnected uh, it is uh, interdisciplinary um, and it is very necessary that we continue to work to, um, as we say down south, I'm, I'm, I'm down in South Carolina, that we sing from the same hymnal. It is very important that um, we are conscious about where we are, uh, what page we are in, in that hymnal, in order for us to, at some point, um, you know, in that um, that 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 book of songs, you know, that it's somewhere that we catch up and harmonize. And so, if it uh, if we don't recognize and acknowledge that not only is connectivity important, but I will shift things to the, you know, the analog world, that um, that healthcare on the ground, face-to-face, -face, that interaction, that if we don't have the biases checked, if we don't have the barriers uh, you know, to access checked, just me finding a clinician, getting it to a clinician, and having a clinician listen to me and treat me with respect, if all of those other things are not in place, then you can connect me, you can, you know, you can give me, I don't care how many genes uh, that are a part of, of my existence. If I am getting bad analog inputs, if I am being treated badly, if I don't feel comfortable, um, if you as a clinician do not respect me um, and aren't really interested in healing me, then a digital health solution is not going to do a bit of good. In fact, it is going to further harm because mm -hmm. what these systems are doing, they're not solving the pro problem. They are amplifying what exists. Mm -hmm. So we need to be real careful about not getting in this single silo or single line of effort to say, oh my gosh, if I have this widget, or if I have this, you know, um, platform, or if I have, uh, you know, uh, this pipe, um, that it's going to solve all our problems. If you got a person at the other end of this device that has not my best interest in mind, then it's going to be further. Uh, it's going to be more efficient uh, for my outcomes to be even more negative. Um, it, these platforms, I, I'm from the South, and I'll, I use the word sparingly agnostic, but these solutions are agnostic. They don't have a heart or soul. Uh, and, and so what they're doing is looking at what you input. Those algorithms are input by a human. They're not self, um, you know, they, they're not self-effectuating. Someone is at the other end of that development spectrum. And if they do not have whole of community in mind, again, with that empathy and with that need to solve what the problems are, then whatever is wrong will be more uh, exaggerated um, and whatever um, uh, hopefully is more right uh, will be more ubiquitous. But we have to work on what's wrong because there are a lot of things wrong in our system. Mm. Tech amplifies what's there already. I like, yeah, it really, really does. And health is more than healthcare. You know, you're saying, you know, you're you're, you're talking about human-centered care. We're thinking about, you know, really, truly humanity, and it's the air we breathe. You know, it's the the spaces and places that we go. It's the food we eat. You know, health is everywhere. And it's everything. And there's tech providers creating fantastic, you know, really creative, interesting, fantastic solutions. But you're right; they amplify what we have already here. Um, I want to get into the human-centered piece uh, in a moment, but I just do want to dive a little bit more. You've 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 spoken about it. You've spoken about the the um, you know if there's a lack of empathy and care, or maybe it's in it. Then there's bias in care. Yeah, there's bias in care. We know more women are invisible in healthcare. There's a higher the outcome issues with how women's health is treated. Has is, a, is a, there's a spotlight happening on that right now, and actually it's it's quite extraordinary 
uh, we, we Ipsos have just launched an entire series on called Hysterical Health and how women's issues are ignored and become invisible because of biases that exist in society. It's just one example. Could you kind of, even in a rapid way or through through one or two things, give me give a bit more of a sense of health inequity that you're aware of that you want to bring to the attention of the audience listening? There was the most troubling article I read a few months ago in the daily newspaper in Columbia, South Carolina. And the headline, if I remember correctly, call, was called The Cut. Now, we might think about the cut in terms of making something or not making something, but this cut was a number of amputations in the zip code uh, that where I spent the majority of my life in Colombia. My zip code had the highest proportion of amputations, and this is in the city of Columbia, South Carolina. This is blocks less than two miles away in that zip from uh, the major hospital system in Columbia, South Carolina. Yet you saw people um, losing limbs at um, just a sad, disproportionate, incredibly painful um, uh, rate. Why is that? You cannot sit here and tell me that African Americans are just predisposed. Um, that's You're dismissing the obvious. You're dismissing the fact that I grew up in a food desert. You're dismissing the fact that even if we're, where there were options, that if a, an apple a, you know, costs more than a candy bar, what do you think somebody's going to choose? You're dismissing the fact um, that um, I would have to take off from work and stay in a clinic all day in order to get seen and the type of interaction I have might not be um, all that engaging or all that desirable. So at every step of the way, from the time that you were born in this brown field uh, that you know might have been a dump, uh, where the dump might be in your backyard that the city or the county or whatever is using, causing further in environmental harms and me having being predisposed to asthma. You're talking about in intergenerational uh, inequities or a lack of access uh, to clean water and, and, and food options. And then you sit here and wonder why um, at, at 30 or 40 or 50, I'm an amputee. There's no mystery there. You know, you know there's no question why this outcome is. You just have the unwillingness, I'm sorry to say, of too many people in our society, unwillingness to do anything about it, unwillingness to open their eyes. Mm -hmm. I shared that article uh, with family members and friends and they, we couldn't talk for a few days. Mm -hmm. But what's the solution? That article ran, they will un undoubtedly win a prize on it. It is one of the, the, the most informative I've ever seen. I, I hesitate to say best because it's so painful. Well, what are we going to do about it? Now, if other things were in place, then these layers of digital solutions would be the solution. But the other things are not in place. Mm -hmm. I cannot take off from work to maybe be seen. I, I cannot do that um, and, and, and keep the rent paid and to be able to afford, hopefully, that apple over that cinnamon bun. So we really have to um, you know, sit back and again, work with technologists and innovators um, and, 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 and regulators um, like I used to be, and to make sure that we're sending the right signals, make sure that we are funding and promoting um, these solutions uh, that have the promise of addressing uh, these disparities. But one-on-one, -on -one, ensuring that um, I have a clean environment, that I have clean and healthy food options, that I can afford connectivity and clean and healthy foods, that I can afford to go to the doctor if I don't have time to go to the doctor, that I have a device that's not going to give out after 200 minutes or 200 texts, you know, that I can afford to keep in touch you know, with the professional. We have to do all of that and consider all of that from design to market. And the market is vast. The, and the engagement is both analog and digital. There is no disconnect uh, when it comes to delivery, uh, when it comes to uh, better health care, better outcomes, uh, and uh, more opportunities 
uh, for those on the wrong side of the digital divide. Yeah, yeah uh, it's like a deep breath. It's just, um, yeah, it's a lot. It's sobering. Yeah, it's so, it so is, it really is. I'll tell you what, 30 minutes is not enough for this conversation and time with you. I'm, I'm just looking and I'm like, okay, right. So we, there's so much to still say. Um, and I'm sure people can follow up with you to kind of get deeper into this. And I urge you all to, because this is really, really important. And I think Mignon's given some fantastic uh, inroads to really think about intention and think about your role, because we all have a role. So let's, let, let's kind of focus on that now. Um, what is it people can do at an individual level, citizens for their own health? What can they do? What can I do? What can we all do? And then what's, what is it that really we're saying to the industry about what they need to be doing? You've kind of, you have spoken about it, but let's really kind of hammer home the message. What would you like to say? So I will start from the individual to the more, um, I guess, I don't want to say complex, but the more involved. Each of us can take someone to the doctor, take notes, reinforce that with the individual, to better ensure that they uh, adhere to the protocols, that they have the support needed. One of us can adopt one other person. And if each of us does that, um, think about the number of people that might be on a better track. No, regardless of who we are, what we are, or how much we know, each of us can do that. So that's, you know, to me, the most basic, where you can literally help your neighbor uh, survive and, and be more healthy. As an innovator or technologist, from the beginning, as you are coming up with your design, ensure that's inclusive when it comes uh, with your testing um, and your protocols and refining. Make sure those teams are inclusive, that you talk to the community that not only you have in mind, but the others who could possibly later in that cycle uh, be a, you know, a part or benefit. Make sure you are doing no harm. Uh, when you come up with the design, you know, uh, with, with the, the models. As a regulator, as a, a government agency, regardless of where you are, ensure that you're sending the right price signals, the right support signals, the right regulatory signals to, to, to ensure that the right uh, systems, uh, the, uh, the, the companies that are doing the most innovation that are closing these gaps that have the solutions, that they have the support that respectfully either big tech or big telecom is not gobbling up or taking all the oxygen um, you know, out of the room and leaving some of the best innovators uh, behind to starve. We can do that um, you know, in terms of you know, government. And those of us in the private sector uh, who might have a dollar or two to crowd uh, fund or invest, let us let our money follow where our hearts and where the opportunities and where the markets are. We cannot afford to be passive. We don't have to be passive or sit along um, you know, the sidelines. Uh, we, can, um, we make decisions um, based on market and economic purchases. We, we vote with our feet and our, our wallets. Let's do that here when it comes to innovation and design. If you know somebody has a grand idea, cool together and be an extended uh, digital family and support that model, support that innovation, and help that innovator uh, get from uh, market design uh, you know, to, to market and help them with all of the bells and whistles. If you're a lawyer, help them put together the project. If you, if you deal with regulation, help them navigate you know, those paths. Each of us has a role to play and there is no role too big or too small. Uh, for us to engage and be a part of. If we want different outcomes, it's going to take a community of 300 plus million U.S. citizens uh, to be, be active, not passive, uh, about having better outcomes in a, a more digitally equitable and empathetic future. Goodness. I'm leaving Reach Live today richer, richer in insight, richer in just yeah, a behavior pattern that I can do. I mean, it's so powerful. Just go take, go along, take someone to help with their health, help with the playback, help them understand. So much is lost in the consultation. So much is lost in mismanagement of health. 
um, extraordinary stuff, Mignon. Thank you so much. Genuinely, thank you so much My for pleasure. your insight and your words. Um, I hope this goes far and wide because uh, there's so much learning here. So thank you. Thank you so much to everyone joining us for Reach Live. Uh, I have no doubt you've enjoyed it because I certainly have. Um, so we'll be back next month uh, with a new guest. Please sign up and subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can catch it on LinkedIn Live. Uh, follow the handles for Reach where we bring more excellent content like today and some extraordinary individuals. Mignon, thank you so much. And I wish everybody a wonderful Friday. Thank you.